right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Mark Mori, who is in Vermont. How are you doing, Mark? Doing well, John. Excellent, excellent. And what we're going to talk about today is management during crises. And obviously, a lot of people have been through a, a global crisis over the last like 12 months or so, but crises, you know, of varying sizes are things that come and go with, with organizations. So Mark, let's from the outset, let's talk about what is, what are the, some of the fundamental differences between manage, managing during a crisis and just management in general? Well, I was talking with a COO the other day that I've been working with for a number of years. And one of the things that she and I were riffing on was, you know, she's a systems thinker, which I am too, mm -hmm. is, is how can we nudge people uh, over long periods of time to develop really good positive leadership behaviors, especially ongoing learning and development, self-management, mm -hmm. uh, self-observing. Mm -hmm. And then during crisis, we get bumped out of those places how do you respond? And um, I mean, I saw a firsthand huge crisis at, at Nike this the beginning of this year because I was working with them when this all unfolded. And what's counterintuitive for someone who's ex-military mm -hmm. is to actually slow down and connect during crisis. He had he had a way of being that was default, and uh, it was he, his adrenaline got stoked and he loved urgency but it's not necessarily what other people needed they weren't former combat pilots mm -hmm. so uh it was a different experience for everyone else and so we can talk more about that but that's that's the the, the contrast i want to set yeah no it's it's interesting because i've spoken about this before but i worked in one company at one stage where the senior management were great crisis managers they were just terrible at avoiding crises. Uh, they never did, any, they never fixed anything afterwards, but they were fantastic when it was a crisis. And it was exactly what you said, urgency, gather loads of people together, like fly in somewhere, you know, make sure they get the customer back on site or whatever it was we need, we had to do. Um, but, but it was always, it was, it was chaotic. I would say that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I noticed this is going off trail a little bit in our conversation, but it's related. I noticed that when things calmed down, that particular type A personality uh, was uncomfortable with ongoing proactive learning and development and tended to create a crisis to get that adrenaline back up again. And so uh, what could have been a, a systematic change management process became a kind of a uh, a cortisol <laughs> overload yeah. for the employees and they eventually lost a lot of trust and rapport with him. So I started working on how to reduce that edge and create more rapport and connection um, through routines. One of them, which was uh, opening up gratitude as part of workplace meeting protocol. And, and okay. So that's an interesting concept. So what do you mean by that? Well, um, I, I see gratitude as an intentional mind focus activity. And you could consider it as an instrument of leadership because it requires you, the way I think of gratitude, it requires you to consider that which you're interdependent with and your life wouldn't be as good without. You could call it counting your blessings, but right. it's you, you can get into a crabby state of mind and consider, oh, life's against me or things are always really terrible. And that may or may not be true, but you know what you seek, you find. So right. to get yourself back in the game, this is like a collective version of we're all going to do our best to put our mind on, well, what are we thankful for today? What can we, we look towards? And it builds a personal relationship to that muscle and a collective one. And obviously, then when you do have a crisis or when the going gets tough, then you're more likely to have that uh, buy in that people are more likely to rally around if, if that's the if that's the environment otherwise. Exactly. And you can call on that. And there, there was a scenario I'm just remembering now between 
two sets of executives and uh, two were men and two were women and the urgency came driving in because there was a crisis and uh, mm -hmm. Michelle said, uh, could we just pause for a second? What are you thankful for? And it, it, it was like, what? <laughs> what are you saying? She goes, I just, just 60 seconds. Like, what's one thing you're thankful for? And she knew she wanted to bring on board more than the lower brainstem. She mm -hmm. wanted to bring on all of the faculties, but it's going to require the parasympathetic nervous system and the breathing and the mind's eye focus. And because we had entrained that in the environment as a cultural approach, which is, those are my two prongs really, executive coaching and company culture development. Right. It allowed her to pull on that in a moment of crisis connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think uh, the other part of it, obviously, in in crisis is, and we've seen this over the last while, particularly with a lot of people working virtually for the first time, and that is the critical importance of of communication and and regular communication and really kind of being as transparent as you can possibly be because when people are isolated or alone or whatever they tend to fill in the gaps if you're not mm -hmm. giving them the information and being transparent mm -hmm. that's right yeah we tend to make stuff up when when something's missing yeah so um so what are some of the things that you think that uh, how um leaders can improve or maximize communication particularly during a crisis and what and what form should that communication take there's yeah there's there's lots of different strategies um so i would think more from a, a place of principles and technology and then i would say mm -hmm. choose your techniques um trial and error wise but one of the things that's really important is is to be considering going into a communication, uh, what's the context of this relationship? What's the context of what they're going through right now? And if you don't know, and you're more internally considering what, what you need from this, you might wanna just take a pause and consider what's their life like right now? So that's one, like have an aim, what's their context? And two, uh, ask an open-ended type question. This is a technique, but the principle is, it allows for some unknown to happen between the two of you and it creates a fresh answer, something that they're going to search for. So, you know, what are you struggling with right now? Or what's something mm -hmm. you're learning about yourself this week? What's, what's unfolding? And then listen, you know, that starts to generate uh, a fresh conversation that's less transactional and more relational. And then you can get to the business at hand. And I think the other thing as well is, uh, you know, obviously different people react to crises in different ways and different people operate during a crisis in different ways. And, and obviously you have to make sure that it's not just, you know, that you can accommodate and leverage the, the strengths of everybody without sort of trying to force everybody into one mode of operation. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. You want to be at present so that you're not genericizing this relationship like every other one that's for sure mm -hmm. um, and what are some of the things that you think people overlook in a crisis leaders overlook in a crisis um waiting is an option right. <laughs> pausing is an option uh there's an awful lot of uh i don't know i when i think of myself sometimes i feel like as a leader people are looking at me what are you going to mm -hmm. do about the situation and i can forget that pausing is an option that a lot of times things change wait five minutes that's the famous saying about new england weather if you don't like it wait five minutes mm -hmm. and so you want to you know like i was saying before getting yourself into a state where you're using all of your mental faculties which can include deep breathing taking deep three breaths right. Right? you know and um and then you know, gathering information around what's the status, what's changed since we last heard. And like with, with first aid, have you ever done emergency first, first responder training, John? Oh, I have done, uh, I've done CPR and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that they, they work on in that crisis is you take a set of stats and then you monitor those every minute to two minutes. So mm -hmm. it's not the first set of stats you get, it's how they're trending over time. So I think that's an important strategy so that you don't panic at the first set of information you yeah. get because it could be incorrect or it could be an anomaly. But if, once you see it trending, you have to then look ahead and say, how are we going to meet this off at the pass if it continues going this way? Yeah, and, and, uh, and it's fascinating because that's such a, it's probably counterintuitive to a lot of people is to take the, um, 
is to is to pause or to gather more than just the uh, the immediate information because let's face it you know when the going gets tough what the tough get busy right and we want and to your point is <laughs> you're kind of to your point is you're kind of uh, you know standing there thinking well I'm a leader I better be seen to be doing something whereas in fact actually being seen to take a pause and actually to evaluate the situation probably sends a much better message to your people. Right. Yeah. There's a, there's a sense that they can trust you and there's a, there might be an inquiry into what their intelligence is, as opposed to thinking you have to solve something. You only know half the problem. Most managers or leaders are unaware of what their employees are doing. And in crisis, you don't want to go in there and start telling them to go left instead of right when they actually know what the problem is. So I think the other aspect is take extra time to inquire into what do they know about the situation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's an, uh, that's another thing as well is I think that sometimes, you know, leaders in crisis, um, you know, sort of feel like they have to do everything themselves, they got to take it on their shoulders, you know, they have to be the singular person there, when to your point is, uh, you know, the more, the more you gather people around you, you take inputs, uh, the more people feel like they're part of this process. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And what are some of the what, what are some of the ways there that you think that uh, companies and leaders can prepare themselves better for a future crisis. Because let's face it, we're going to have one on, I mean, every company is going to have their own mini crises at times, and then we're going to have some collective ones. I mean, I always go, I, I came to the States in, um, in the late 90s uh, from Ireland. And since I've been here, I've, I came to Silicon Valley during the dot-com. So I've been through the dot-com implosion. I've been through mm-hmm. 9-11. I've been through the financial crisis and now mm-hmm. COVID. So from my perspective, I believe, you know, every three to four years, you're going to have something, something major is going to come up. So how can you better prepare? Yeah, well, this is where uh, we look for enduring solutions and enduring cultural practices. My background um, I think that brings a a distinction that's different here is that I've spent a lot of time in communities looking at what makes certain cultures resilient over others. And, you know, one of the anthropological and sociological attacks I've taken on is indigenous communities and the relationship to the unpredictability of nature. If you, if we have to lead hand to mouth all the time and have our survival skills be at play, what, mm-hmm. what would we do proactively as a cultural technology to endure? Because we can't just right. pretend like things are, are going to be the same. They're actually never the same. So we're, we're a bit of an anomaly, I think, as human species right now that we, we think we hit status quo or we can actually return to normal. What you're saying, you know, imagine if we were in full survival all the time, but it wasn't urgent. It was just the way it was, yeah. right? right? So- you know, one of the things I noticed about certain communities is they have a lot of lateral connection. They, there might be hierarchy, but there's there's an extreme amount of horizontal connection as well as uh, personal agency. Mm-hmm. So people have a sense of where the whole community is going and there are traditions to follow, but then there is enough autonomy that people can forge bonds if necessary. And, you know, one of the examples I like to draw from is comparing Hurricane Katrina with Hurricane Aniki, which hit two different mm-hmm. communities, um, but they were both coastal communities. And one of them, as we know, was in New Orleans, and the other one was mm-hmm. in Kauai, which had a dominant indigenous population. And the the difference between the two communities is one was was devastated and there the word pipeline and, and uh, silos was heavily discussed. And in the other one, the communities had such a fabric of interconnection that if you were separated from your family, you actually knew other people who could take care of you. Resources were easily shared. There was a distributed leadership that was was already practiced. And while it might seem overly proactive to, to wire your organization that way, if we're seeing disruption so frequently, maybe it's not such a bad idea. No, I don't think it is. And I think, to be honest, I think you're, uh, if any organization is continuing to operate in a very, very rigid and hierarchical and demarked um, format, and and their silos, as you say, and people are staying within their lanes and all of that, and they're not being more matrix, they're not working across, oh, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I, I, I just don't think that's a sustainable model anymore. Right. Yeah. That's right. And the question is, well, how do we do that? I think mm-hmm. some of the uh, inheritance we have, you could 
probably goes back to the industrial revolution and a more of a, a mechanized type right. factory workplace, right? And we know that from the education system. So um, I take large direction from how the natural world functions. I have 30 years of being a naturalist and working in nature and how human beings relate to the natural world. And even from a, a, a place of ecology, how do we interrelate and develop to fabric in human communities? So like one software company I worked with, um, we started a, an ongoing program that it had, an, it had a capacity building aspect to it. So it wasn't just proactive. In the short run, people were learning about themselves. And so that was good. But the design was we built cohorts of eight, eight to 10 people from cross-functional departments. And we did a two month long seminar where we did an in-person immersion outdoors, but we worked on these parasympathetic nerve right. approaches, Sit, sitting alone in nature, you know, being present to their senses, doing partner work around this open-ended questioning, gratitude. But these were not people who knew each other in this 150 mm -hmm. person company. They had grown too big you know, to know each other anymore. And, um, you know, they weren't going to keep knowing each other, but we started weaving that fabric through this process. And then we just get, used frameworks for uh, what's your current issue? And it could be at home or at work. And that built more rapport around who people were. And so you start to see almost like meristematic cell tissue, which in plants is a cell that could choose to be either a root or a branch. And it, it's, it's in its uh, certain kind of a ready state. So, you know, I have a relationship with you across the department, but next thing you know, we have to work together or I got to expedite something horizontally. I know you, now we can have a rapport that goes quicker because, you know, the crisis demands it. Yeah, and, and I think that's so critically important. And I think that's something that uh, companies ought to look at working on you know, now, uh, not just not just waiting for a crisis to do, but work mm -hmm. on it now too. Because yeah. also I think I think the nature of, work and the way organizations are going to be structured and that in the future, I think you're going to see a lot more, you're certainly going to see a lot more of a distributed workforce, right? I mean, that's a given. Yep. But I think you're also going to see a lot more variable resources like contractors and people like, you know, coming through Upwork and stuff like that, where you're just mm -hmm. contracting in people to do certain tasks or you're, or you have, some regular contractors working with you. So the ability to be able to have all of these people, whether they're working remotely at home, whether they're actually external mm -hmm. to the company, keeping all of that cohesive and, and, mm. and having people, you know, work collaboratively together. I think that's something that businesses are gonna, are gonna be forced to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I saw this in a McKinsey report that came out around the future of work and they were focusing in on uh, the importance of talent development in, in this environment that you're describing. And they did one analysis around the amount of companies that reported they were ready for crisis and the pandemic. And it was like 80%, no way. And then mm -hmm. how many of you are gonna start investing in you know, strategies? And it was like all of them. But the, the, the areas that they were focusing in on had to do with human connection, which was not as important before. And mm -hmm. you can see it you know, in, in other kind of symptomatic ways prior to the pandemic, like, um, you know, the Surgeon General, his name is Murphy, I think, and he worked under Obama and now under Biden. He wrote a book on loneliness and the epidemic of loneliness and how it relates to um, inflammation in the body and chronic illness mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the scale of it that was already taking place in communities. And you, there's research that it was happening in workplaces, even though you know people. So here we are, people who actually were working together and experiencing disconnection. And imagine that affecting performance and you know, all sorts of other costs. You know. So yeah. we know that we know we need this. Yeah, and I think that, and I think that's been brought home, uh, you know, in, in bucket loads during the pandemic. Um, and like you said, I mean, I think this is a this is an ongoing problem that's existed, and unfortunately, we we live in a in a society today that, um, you know, rather than rather than reaching out and bringing people together, it's um, it's a it's increasingly fractured and um, divisive, etc. And so, I think this is a problem that's only going to to get worse unless it's addressed and obviously you can't fix the world but you can certainly fix your company mm -hmm. and and to your mm -hmm. and to your point 
Um, I, I think that's that's going to be the biggest challenge is to make sure that every person in the organization feels connected to the organization, regardless of what their actual circumstances are, as like I said, whether they're remote, whether they're contract, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right on. Yeah. All right. This has been great, Mark. Uh, all of Mark's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Sure. Well, like I said before, I'm an executive coach and I specialize in developing thriving company cultures through these enduring solutions that have a technology to them, not just specific fragmented mm -hmm. techniques. And I like to sum those up in a system called regenerative leadership, not just helping leaders, but helping leaders to help leaders. So there's right. self-observing, self-managing, and even self-remembering, which has to do with who am I and what's my purpose and all that mm -hmm. at a core level for this thriving culture. So, yeah. And, and I think, uh, and I would encourage people to check out Mark, as I said, all of the information will be below this video, but I just something you touched on there. I think it's, it's, it's so incredibly important now it's always been, but I think even more so now is to know your purpose and why you're doing what you're doing, because let's face it, it's been tough over the last year for, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Some more than others, obviously, those have lost people. It has been particularly tough. But but even uh, uh, outside of that, it's been tough for a lot of people. And I think now is the time that you have to take a look at yourself and ask you, why do I do what I do? What's motivating me? Or why? Because otherwise, it's always going to be a struggle because you're not going to have that that inner driver to get you through the hard times. That's right. Yeah, it's an inside job. Yeah, I love that. It's an inside job. Perfect. All right, listen, thanks, Mark. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.